Good morning and welcome to today's event, looking at the barriers to volunteering through a class perspective. My name is Tamsin Russell and I'm delighted to be here. I'm a cis white woman in her early 50s, that takes a hard, hard ask, a blunt fringe and red lipstick. And my role here today as chair is to make sure that you have an opportunity to ask questions, to reflect and to hear from our stellar list of speakers. We are hosting this session on Zoom. So just in terms of basic housekeeping practice, if you're not speaking, if you can put yourself on mute, that would be absolutely great. Feel free, as I've said already, to keep your camera on or off as per your preference and do enable us to be slightly more dialogue-y. So use the chat function to share insights or ask questions and also use the reaction list so that we can get a sense of whether you're enjoying the event or not as the speakers go through. It's sometimes quite hard presenting to avoid. Thank you, Rosie Wiley. The chat function is there for questions. And when we get to the question part of the programme, uh, my colleague Rosie will be sending me those questions and we'll be highlighting those to the panellists. Equally, if you feel comfortable asking questions verbally, then you can also do that. And I will be opening the floor for questions from the floor. As you can see, we've got two BSL interpreters here, which is great. As part of today's session, we will be breaking out into breakout rooms. So if you need and a BSL interpreter to support your engagement and participation in those breakout rooms, please could you private message Rosie B H E S so that she can ensure that you're in a space with a BSL interpreter. All learning should be done in a safe and secure space. We are open to everybody's opinions, but we do expect all participants to act respectfully and professionally. So if anyone is using offensive language, it's discriminating, it's being threatening or gestures, what we have got is a commitment to remove those individuals from the event. And my colleagues back of house will do that. If you have any concerns at all around anyone else in this space, feel free to direct message the other Rosie from HES, and she is waving at the moment, so Rosie Wiley, and she will then be able to deal with any of your concerns offline to create this uh, safe space for all of us to participate. I've already highlighted that the event is being recorded and it will be available later on and also there are captions that can be uh, identified or enabled at your or your particular end so what are we going to do in the next uh, couple of hours so removing class barriers to heritage volunteering is the name of the event it's delivered by make your mark and heritage volunteer group and for those of you less familiar with Make Your Mark, Make Your Mark's campaign aims to increase the number and the diversity of heritage volunteers in Scotland and promises to promote heritage volunteering opportunities and connect heritage professionals nationwide to deliver uh, effective good practice and programmes. I'm here with my heritage volunteer hat on in some capacity. And for those of you that don't know the heritage volunteer group, we're a UK wide sector support organization with the vision to unlock the power of heritage volunteering. And we do that through advocacy, development, events and funding. So I think that's all I need to say in terms of the event today. We have got a range of different speakers and also a workshop, which I'm really excited to participate in. So without further ado, I'm going to put myself on mute and I'm going to invite our first um, speakers. So Michelle and uh, Fran from Museum of Muck. Museum of Muck is a grassroots organisation introduced and implemented to support those of different backgrounds coming into the heritage space. So I'm now going to hand over to Fran and Michelle. Over to you guys. Thank you, Tamsin. I'm just going to share my screen because um, we have a presentation. I'll do it very quickly. Share. 
present and I will say things as I do them. That's um that's fun. Um, so yeah, me and Michelle are from Museum as Muck. We're going to talk a bit more about Museum as Muck in in a moment. Um, but we have um a short presentation at the start now about um class and what we mean when we talk about class and a bit about what Museum as Muck do. Um, but to start us off, we're using Mentimeter, so we want to like go straight into an interactive um bit <laughs> um so i think we'll share on the chat um there's a website you need to go to you can do that on your phone or on another window as you're in um your computer or on an ipad um so if you go to www.menti.com and use the code 46376683 um you should be able to interact um i don't know if michelle you just want to introduce yourself now just quickly <laughs> Um, yes, sorry, I'm off mute, aren't I? Um, gosh, this technology gets the better of me sometimes. Um, so hopefully you can all get on to, to Menti and kind of give us, a, give us a shout in the chat if, if you're not able to, but it really helps us kind of be a bit more interactive. But um, my name's Michelle. I am a white woman in my late 30s, and I am going to talk to you today about Museum as Muck which I started in 2018. Um, but yeah, first of all, we're just gonna try and establish a bit of a foundation around what we mean by class, because it can be quite a tricky thing to talk about and understand for some people. Brilliant. Back to you, Fran. And I should say, sorry, I'm Fran. I'm a white woman in my mid thirties. Um, I've got plaits and kind of a plain face today um beautiful face describe yes <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first thing we want to do just to get an idea of who's in the room and the different class backgrounds um we're going to ask you to um contribute to a uh, jobs board so we want you to think back to when you were 14 what your main the main um, earner in your household did for a profession so just to say this is anonymous so it won't come up like who who's saying what but just so we kind of get an idea of who's in the room and and um yeah and the different class backgrounds that are represented so I'll give you a second to do that and then we'll talk through it a little bit. Ooh. And if you can't see, you know, um, the exact job role that your your main carer did, just do a kind of best guess, nearest um, selection. Yeah, we're not going to be testing you on it, so no, <laughs> no stress. <laughs> Brilliant. So stuff is coming in as we speak. I think it's about 59 people who have contributed. Um, lots of colours, which is good. Lots of spread across the chart. Um, so just to kind of explain this a little bit, um, the occupations towards the left are kind of more traditionally uh, working class kind of um, working kind of jobs um, and then towards the right is more kind of um, modern professional um, modern um, middle class kind of to upper class um, well not really upper class but middle to upper middle um, professionals so people from backgrounds those kinds of backgrounds um, this is quite nice because sometimes we don't have such <laughs> a spread across the across the chart so it's really nice to see that we've got um, quite a mix but also some people you know there is kind of a a more represented group normally I would ask if anyone wants to talk about this but because we just for time we're kind of um going to move on but just to give you an idea so we you know there is um in this room a spread across across um the different class backgrounds but definitely a leaning towards a more middle middle class background and no representation of anyone that um, came from backgrounds where their parents were unemployed or weren't working or were in a care um, facility. So yeah, I'm gonna hand over to Michelle now. Oh, I move it forward, there you go. <laughs> Thanks so much, um, Fran, and thanks everyone for contributing to that. I always think it's quite useful for us to place ourselves 
in in that position um, when we begin thinking about class, it's useful to kind of bring it to the to the personal. Um, but you know, what do we mean when we say working class? <laughs> I think it means it can mean different things to different people and people interpret it in different ways. So it's useful for us to establish what we mean when we meet when we say working class. And um, this is, you know, uh, a shorthand, actually, because I mean, we could do whole sessions on language around class and, you know, are you working class if, for example, um, your parents were unemployed or never worked, you know, are you working class? Are you benefits class? Are you council class? And lots of people have different ways of talking about their backgrounds. But we, we um, Museum as Muck has chosen um, through consultation with our members to use the term working class as a shorthand when we're talking about people from low social um, socioeconomic backgrounds. But just to break it down a bit more, because I think it's important for us to remember that when we talk about work being working class, it is about um, low economic capital. It is about living in poverty. It is about being deprived of financial resources, but it's also other things in addition to that. So we've covered economic capital, but it's also social capital. And that's who you know, and the networks that you have. And when we're talking about careers and getting into jobs, um, you know, these barriers are really, really relevant. So if you come from a background where nobody has ever worked in a museum or nobody ever worked at all, your social capital is going to be lower than other people in the sector. And then um, the last one that we talk about is cultural capital. So these are the experiences and opportunities that you've been privy to as a, as a young person, um, you know, were you um, uh, were you able to take part in kind of extracurricular activities? Were you taken to museums or theatres? Um, but also your level of education. So those from working class backgrounds are less likely to have, um, you know, formal qualifications, and particularly further or higher level um, educational qualifications. So when we talk about working class, really, what we mean is those who come from backgrounds where they were deprived in, in you know, across these three areas. So at the beginning, we did a jobs board with you. Um, and I said, you know, we do that because it's helpful for us to bring, bring our own experiences into the room when we start talking about this. But um, you'll notice we did it based on one question, um, which is quite bold, uh, but actually, um studies have shown that this is the single most effective measure to ask when um asking people about class backgrounds interesting a lot of a lot of people get it wrong when you ask them to self-identify that is not an accurate way of doing it um you can um do a much more in-depth kind of class analysis where you use this measure around what you know um your kind of background um, and your parents or main carers roles, but um, you can add other things to that to get a bit more of a nuanced and in-depth measure. But if you're looking for, to collect data, um, this is the single most um, accurate question that you can ask if you're just asking one question. So Museum of Mark, why do we exist? Well, um, You've probably guessed it by now, but there's not enough working class people in the heritage sector. Um, it's not representative of all of our, all of society. So 39% of our population, UK population, is working class, and only 23% of our workforce is working class. So already there's an obvious disparity there. Um, but also what we know um, is that whilst there are working class people in museums, 23% of us apparently, um, we're not represented in those um, decision-making positions. We're not in the leadership roles. We're not in the change-making positions. Um, so there's an issue there with not only kind of getting in, but also progressing in the sector and being um, in those more influential roles. 
we feel it's important here when we're talking about class is to to bring an intersectionality because actually if you're working class you're more likely to be um from a group um of another protected characteristic also so class isn't actually a protected characteristic under law currently um but if we look at some of the other protected characteristics if you're working class you know you're more likely to be a woman you're more likely to be from an ethnic minority and you're more likely to live with a disability so we have kind of multiple barriers on top of each other and again you know just thinking about that double disadvantage that working class people are likely to have um men are, men from privileged backgrounds are 4.8 times more likely to secure work and creative occupations than working class women and somebody who's working class and living with a disability is three times less likely than a privileged able-bodied person to secure a job in a creative op occupation um, and we've mentioned already about education so those from a privileged background with a degree are 5.5 times more likely to secure um, a creative role than those from working class backgrounds. So Museum as Muck, what do we do? Very briefly, um, as I said, we kind of started in 2018 and this was um, almost like a need to build um, um, a grassroots network and, and community for us working class people in the, sect in the sector for support and solidarity and to share and to come together. Um, and we've now got over 600 members across the UK. So that's our, our main focus and our priority. Um, but we also do external work as well. And we work with organisations to think about how they can um, diversify their workforce, including volunteers, how they can look at um, uh, um, instilling working class stories in collections, um, and interpreting them and how they can um, reach working class audiences. So we do a lot of um, kind of consultation and training with organisations as well. So we've got the kind of network first and foremost, and then the external. And that's, we're stopping there for now. <laughs> yes. That, okay. So that's our brief introduction. So I think we'll pass on to, is it Debbie? Or back to Tamsin. It's back to me. Thank you so much. It's so interesting going back through those three different types of capital. And I, I, I thank my mum daily around her persistence around loving museums, art and culture, whereas I might well uh, resonate very clearly with the uh, economic and social capital. Uh, uh, definitely, uh, she was right up there. So it's so interesting. So thank you so much. I hope we've all found our location or where we feel we are in terms of the, the definitions or the shorthands around working class. We've got plenty of time to explore that in more depth when we get to our workshop. But without further ado, what I'd like to do is invite Debbie Maltman, who is a research officer from Volunteer Scotland, to talk around uh, current research into heritage volunteering. Um, at Volunteer Scotland, she works primarily with quantitative data, I'm going to love this session, to enhance our knowledge around volunteering and participation in Scotland. Before joining Volunteer Scotland, Debbie completed a Master's in Data Science for Business at University of Stirling, for which she gained distinction, uh, won the Data Lab Student Placement Competition, and Debbie's studies uh, initiated her interest in the importance of data-driven insights evidence-based decision-making is all where it's at. So I'm gonna hand over to Debbie, who's gonna take you through her presentation for 15 minutes, Understanding Heritage Volunteering in Scotland. And Debbie's gonna be one of our panel members later on today. So please do store up any questions you would like to ask her or put them in the chat. Over to you, Debbie. Thank you. I'll just share my presentation. Um, so I'm Debbie, um, as was mentioned, and I'm going to have a little bit of a look at understanding volunteering and heritage with you today. Um, we're going to look at the current 
adult formal participation in Scotland's culture and heritage sector. We're going to look at who volunteers in the sector. We're going to turn things on its head a little bit and hopefully make people think a little bit when we talk about who contributes the most to Scottish volunteering and what opportunities that brings for culture and heritage. And then we have to, we felt we had to bring a little bit about the cost of living crisis um, and the potential impacts of that, because unfortunately after COVID-19, we've moved into another crisis and it might impact um, on um, how easy it is to um, be more inclusive um, with volunteers at the moment. And I'll explain um, why we think that in um, the slides. So we're going to start off with a really good news story. Um, I will at this point just mention that culture and heritage is grouped together as a volunteer activity type in the Scottish Household Survey. That's where most of our data on volunteering comes from. So throughout the presentation I will talk about culture and heritage together. There's maybe a slight definitional assumption made in the Scottish Household Survey that people understand what heritage encompasses, that um, it encompasses maybe natural heritage, but I think that's something that we'll maybe explore in the next, whenever the Scottish Household Survey is um, reviewed next, just around maybe building out those definitions a little bit more so that we make sure that everyone irrespective of the type of cultural or heritage vol volunteering um, is included in the stats. But a really good news story for volunteering and culture and heritage to start with. So in Scotland, um, between 2018 and 2020, formal volunteer participation has remained static at 26%. Um, but during the same period, the percentage of Scottish adults volunteering in culture and heritage has increased by 2%. That's over 23,000 more Scottish adults volunteering in culture and heritage in 2020 than 2018. So that's a real positive, especially when you think that the way the Scottish Household Survey asked the question is around volunteering in the previous year. So 2020 is going to pick up have picked up a lot of COVID data. So the fact that participation within culture and heritage increased even over that COVID period where so many sectors struggle is a real positive message. And we wanted to look at something that would give us some correlation between people's engagement with a historic environment and adult volunteer participation. So we used data from 2019 Scottish Household Survey and it's really, really interesting. So if you look at people with no visit, so they're not engaging with the historic environment, their formal participation rate is 19%, which is below the Scottish average of 26. But you can see that as soon as there's any engagement with the historic environment, even if it's once in 12 months, that jumps up to 30%, which is above the Scottish national average. And if you look at those that are engaging with a historic environment at least once a week, the participation rates are massive 60%. We always have to have a little bit of a health warning around um, correlation and causation. So does um, engaging with a historic environment encourage volunteering or does volunteering encourage engagement with historic environment? But we see real strong links, and this isn't just the only question, but I've only put one in today. Um, there are really strong links in the Scottish Household Survey showing that people that engage with the historic environment or are engaging with culture have much higher participation rates than those that don't. So we're going to have a wee look at who volunteers in Scotland's culture and heritage sector. And what we've done is take all of the Scottish volunteers and look at which age group, gender, disability, ethnicity. And the way that we're going to kind of bring in class is looking at the Scottish index of multiple deprivation quintiles. So what that does is split Scotland kind of essentially into five areas 
Quintile 1 is the 20% most deprived in Scotland and Quintile 5 is the 20% least deprived in Scotland. Um, it doesn't just look at income, it does look at access to services, education, crime rates. So it's kind of the closest measure that we have to kind of class within the Scottish Household Survey. So we didn't only do this for Scotland, we did it for culture and heritage as well. And there's some real positive differences and um, not so positive differences. So age, um, culture and heritage basically follows a pattern from Scottish household, from Scotland as a whole. So most of your volunteers come from the 45 to 59 age group. Gender in Scotland, we see more female participation. In culture and heritage, we see more male participation, which is really, really interesting. Um, in the Scottish Household Survey, female formal volunteer participation has always been at least 2% higher than male participation. So there's something around culture and heritage that's encouraging male volunteers, which is a positive for us to see more of a balance. Around disability, so those without a disability make up the main proportion of volunteers both in Scotland and in culture and heritage. But if we look at the stats kind of backwards, so in Scotland, only 19% um, of volunteers have a disability. It's 21% for culture and heritage. So again, there's something working within culture and heritage to bring disabled volunteers, to enable them to volunteer. So again, that's really positive. Um, there's maybe some best practice in there that could be um, rolled out further. The same for ethnicity. Um, in the Scottish Household Survey, ethnicity is only reported on two levels. So it's either white or other ethnic groups. So the majority of Scottish volunteers in culture and heritage is white, but it's 4% are ethnic minorities within culture and heritage, where it's 3% in Scotland. So again, it's a slight difference, but it's a positive difference. It's, in, it's widening that diversity within culture and heritage. The one kind of bad news um, or slight, yeah, we'll call it bad news for now, um, which comes back to class. So in Scotland as a whole as well, um, those live, living in the most deprived backgrounds make up the majority of volunteers at 27%. In culture and heritage, it's more pronounced, it's more prominent. Um, so 35% of your volunteers are coming from the least deprived backgrounds in Scotland. Ideally, if everything being equal, we would expect 20% coming from each quintile, but it's not the case. Um, and that difference is much more pronounced in culture and heritage, which we can see on this slide. So if we compare um, Scotland to the culture and heritage sector, so Scotland's a blue, um, bars and culture and heritage is the orange bars. We can see that for culture and heritage volunteering, the proportion of volunteers from Quintile 1, 2 and 3, so that's the 60% most deprived areas in Scotland. It's underrepresented. Um, it's lower than the Scottish average, whereas for Quintiles 4 and 5, it's overrepresented. And the most pronounced difference is for those living in Quintile 5, which is the least deprived areas. And there's a 9% difference there. So now to kind of think about things a little bit differently. Um, sometimes we hear, well, participation rates are lowest for those in the most deprived areas. It's the same for Scotland. You know, why should we try and change that? Why don't we keep things the way they are? So on the left of the screen, we've got the formal participation rates by um, Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation Quintiles. We're using 2018 data as Scottish Household Survey only gives us um, the hours data we need for these calculations every two years. And unfortunately, 2020 raw data has not been released yet. But we can see that pattern again from quintile one to five. So as um, you become or you live in a less deprived area, then your volunteer participation rate goes up. But what if we think, what if we look at the people in these areas that are volunteering? So one way we can look at it is intensity of volunteering. Um, this is done as an average over four weeks. 
And the kind of key ones we want to look at um, this morning are the blue bars, which are high intensity volunteering. And then the kind of inverse, so the opposite of that is low intensity volunteers, which is the kind of beige color bar. If you look at volunteers coming from Quintel 1, 19% are high intensity volunteers. That's the second highest. Quintel 3 is the highest at 20%. That's higher than Quintel 5. So where you can um, encourage people, where we can break down the barriers to people from deprived areas, volunteering in culture and heritage, the efforts there, it's not that they don't participate, they give more than um, their peers in Quintel 5. And we can look at that in a slightly different way. And that's the formal mean. So that's just the average hours um, for a person living in each of the quintiles. Quintile one, again, it, this tells the same story. Quintile one comes out highest, it's joint highest with quintile three. So they're given on average 10 hours of vol formal volunteering time a week. So although the participation rates are lowest um, and they have been since the Scottish Household Survey began, the average numbers, although they're virtually identical, where volunteers from the most deprived communities in Scotland engage in volunteering, they're giving the most time. So if we could increase volunteer participation in culture and heritage, <clears throat> sorry, we're bringing a whole new pool of volunteers that volunteer with a high intensity and a high number of hours. But the benefits aren't just the culture and heritage. They're to those people that are volunteering and to Scotland. We know from previous research, there's a lot of it on our website, that uh, volunteering has really positive health benefits. It's been shown to improve people's physical health and perhaps more importantly, coming from COVID-19 and now going into a cost of living crisis, it really helps improve people's mental health. So it reduces social isolation and loneliness. It can help with depression. It's, and those um, living in the most deprived areas have poorer health outcomes. So there's more benefit from volunteering to those living in the most deprived areas. So we can benefit the volunteers as well by helping perhaps them overcome some of those health um, issues that they're experiencing, particularly during particularly from the COVID-19 period into the cost of living crisis. And if we can bring those health and wellbeing benefits to those that most need it in the most deprived areas in Scotland, there's also a benefit to Scotland. So we just wanted to bring a little bit of the implications for, of the cost of living crisis and volunteering to the presentation. It slightly changes things because we're in a different climate um, to what we've been previously, although it is another crisis. Um, so we've written our report that's on our website. Um, we realised there was a gap in evidence around the implications of the cost of living crisis on volunteering. We wrote a paper at PACE. Um, we wrote it quite quickly, undertaking a literature review. And the reason for kind of the speed of the first report was we wanted to get it in front of MSPs at the SNP National Conference because we want um, this to, to be in front of them for them to be aware of. Um, and we think it's really critically important. We will be updating our publication <clears throat> and producing um, quarterly bulletins um, throughout the cost of living crisis. So we kind of use an analytical impact model. So we think the impacts on organizations, the impacts on people, the impacts on communities are all interlinked. And in turn, they all impact on volunteering and volunteers. So at the moment, the data showing us that we have an increased demand for volunteer services, but volunteer numbers. We have may contract on the slide, but we're starting to see that they are contracting. We've seen from the Scottish Third Sector Tracker that volunteering recruitment is now the major issues facing third sector organisations. We're seeing, unfortunately, the potential displacement of employees by volunteers, which goes against the volunteer charter and we see as a key risk. Um, an example of that is around 
um, local authorities engaging volunteers to undertake the roles of striking workers, and that's something we strongly oppose. We're seeing that the health and well-being of volunteers is projected to worsen, um, but less support's available. At the end of COVID-19 or the end of the lockdowns, we saw that burnout and fatigue were becoming quite prominent um, amongst volunteers and we're straight into another crisis. Um, so that's something that really needs to be prioritised as the health and wellbeing of volunteers. Unfortunately, we're seeing places to formal volunteering um, having to reduce hours. We're even seeing closures already and we're not even um, into the really cold winter months. And we think the impacts on volunteering and volunteers is going to be most severe in um, the most deprived areas in society. Debbie, I'm just going to have to stop you there. What would be great yeah. is um, if we can put a copy of that last slide um, and share that, but we are going to move on. A perfect link around talking about um, socially deprived participation and impacts of cost of living. So I'm now going to hand over, thank you so much, Debbie, to Fran and Michelle, who are going to lead the first part of our workshop, specifically looking about identifying and removing barriers. So over to you, Fran and Michelle. Thanks so much. Um, and thank you, Debbie, um, for that. I'm sure that we'll continue on those conversations as, as we go through. Um, Fran's just going to set up the, the presentation again. Um, so you should just be able to um, pick up again on your on your mentee, um, if, whether it was on your phone or your screen. So again, just make sure that you're kind of back on that um, for the next part. Um, are you ready for me to pass over to you, Fran? Yeah, cool. Um, so the next bit, we're going to put you straight away into some uh, breakout rooms so that you can start having a discussion around um, what barriers you think there might be for people from working class backgrounds volunteering in museums or heritage organizations um we you probably like had a lot of um ideas or you might have personal experience um already from the different things we've discussed and the different presentations um so we're going to kind of throw you in to do that quickly um but what you can do is while you're um discussing um, we've set up so that you can add words to a word cloud so when we come back we can have a big discussion and talk a bit more in depth about um, not a big discussion we have to be quite quick but a bit more in depth about the different barriers um, so we're going to break put you into breakout rooms so you can have a chat with each other I think um, if we do about eight minutes chat that would be great um, but yeah, have a think about, so obviously we've talked about um, the different times types of capital. So I think just bear them in mind when you're thinking about the different um, things. People are already started contributing, that's great. <laughs> um, so yeah, Rosie, if you'd be able to put us into the breakout rooms now, that'd be great, thank you. Hello everyone, welcome back. Um, I can see there's still some a few things being added to the to the word cloud. Um, but we're not going to spend too much time on this, but I just want to say this is a brilliant word cloud. I can see like lots of um, things that are definitely barriers. And it's great to see that they're not all um, around so um, economic barriers, um, which of course are a big thing. But um, I I'm sure you've seen word clouds before, but the bigger words are ones that more than one person have said. Um, and then lots of small words that I can hardly even see now because you've just added so much, which is brilliant. So I'm just going to move us on. I hope that was useful um, and we can share the word cloud with people later. Um, but I'm just going to move us on just in because of, we're running out of time um, to a list that we prepared, which isn't extensive. And you might have had other things on your list, but I just want to make sure I've got time to go through some of the things that our network mm -hmm. and um, we find as barriers to um, to volunteering. So obviously, I think a lot of people brought up working for free. And obviously, when you're volunteering, sometimes that is actually at a cost. Um and obviously that can be very difficult if you have no safety net or you, you know, you uh, have don't have much money, <laughs> basically. Um, so language, um, and this is to do with um, 
kind of understanding um, what people are saying, <laughs> um, not being familiar with uh, kind of internal speech around museums um, or being kind of um, seen as different because of the language that you use. Um, imposter syndrome, um, which is, um, I experienced a bit of that today, um, <laughs> where you kind of um, have a lot of experience and you are in situations where you just feel like you're not worth worthy of being there or you haven't got the experience so it can bring up a lot of other feelings so later on there's um, shame which sometimes can come up with that um, assumptions of shared experiences sometimes in museums or in work environments um, people might talk about things they've experienced and just assume that you have the same thing and that can be very awkward um so like talking about growing up in certain ways or holidays or um extracurricular activities um so being an in-betweener um we mean what we mean by this is um kind of being someone that crosses lots of different um class groups or you're interacting in lots of different class groups or with different people and you're you may be code switching so changing how you speak changing the you know toning down your accent um and that can cause a lot of tension and can be very difficult because you can feel like you don't belong in either group um confidence so obviously all these kind of things might affect how confident you are in different situations to speak up for what you think or speak um about you know ideas you have um or you know if you're interviewing people for volunteer roles you know you might feel less confident or know what to say um I mentioned accents but obviously sometimes people have make assumptions about you because of your accent um so stress so a lot of these things might cause a lot of stress and just to bear in mind yeah people might be carrying all these things you know when they come to speak to you about volunteering or you know be carrying all these things so not be thinking about volunteering um as an option um so uh, in the sector um volunteering is currently a main entry route to um to working in the sector so people not really um understanding that um understanding that it's difficult sector to get into and volunteering needs to be diverse to make sure that the workforce is diverse um so postgraduate qualification so i've definitely seen this and it's really awful like people asking for these on voluntary roles um obviously it's an issue with paid roles as well but um definitely volunteer roles you know you really think through whether you need to ask for a postgraduate qualification because they are um you know they are a barrier for people who might not have been able to get them for all the different reasons um so intersectionality so when we discussed this earlier so it's thinking about the additional barriers that people might have so i'm neurodivergent um I'm also working class. So there's a lot of different things going on for me um, to be able to interact in certain group, in certain settings, um, or to work in, to fit into certain processes. Um, so think about those other protected characteristics and what other um, barriers they might be, be bringing for people that you might not be, might not be visible. Um, so feeder organizations, um, this came up because we were thinking about um, lots of organizations that maybe recruit through universities um and so this kind of um making sure that the pool that you're recruiting from is diverse and if it isn't that you are also maybe looking at other organizations to work with um additional responsibilities so this is um you know volunteers might be um also working alongside volunteering prob probably are if they're um working class um they might have uh, additional studies they might have caring responsibilities they might have lots of different things going on so um that can be a barrier to even kind of you know applying for a role or get into a museum um perceptions so by this we mean the perceptions that people have of museum and heritage organizations so um you know why would i volunteer there it, you know what's the what's the 
charitable goal like what is the why am I giving my time for free to something that maybe I don't perceive as a charity that is doing kind of valuable work um so also again the value of volunteering so maybe not really valuing what volunteering is or not really finding value in volunteering in a you know traditional kind of sense um there may be people might feel there's more useful ways to support their community um and then that leads on to kind of museum museum centric roles so roles that are um that are um imagined by the museum might be very dense and hard to kind of understand if you have no um, previous experience of what museums do and the different roles within museums. Um, and then also um, kind of holistic support, so lack of support for volunteers. So if you think about all those other barriers, if you're also then in a role that you're you know, hoping to get access to move into museums or just to be comfortable in a museum. So depending where you are in your in your life, um, you might need additional support to um, to feel comfortable. So that's our list. It's not extensive. There may, there may be many more things, but just to bear that in mind, um, after the break, we're going to look at these in a bit more detail. So um, I'm just going to stop there. And thank you all so much for all your participation in that. It's really great to see you must have had some very um, useful and in-depth conversations, which is really, really great to see. Um, so I'm going to hand back to Tamsin now. Thank you so much, Fran and Michelle. Um, uh, that's the end of our first part of this workshop. We're going to take a break now. It's just two minutes to 11. So if we could have you back in this space at 10 past 11, so you've got a 12 minute break, do with it what you wish. We'll see you on the other side for the second part of the workshop. Thank you so much. See you soon. Welcome back. Hope we're all refreshed and raring to go for the second part of our workshop with Fran and Michelle. So nothing else from me. Over to them. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. So I'm just going to share my screen again very quickly. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so, you know, you worked really hard and came up with this incredible word cloud, which I thought was really extensive. Um, so well done. Um, but what we want to do is to um, try and think a bit more in depth about those barriers and actually what we can do about them. So we've established that there are many, many barriers for working class people. So in this next part, we're going to talk through an example of a barrier and um, then we're going to get you to have some more conversations and discussions so that you're really applying your thinking today to something that could turn into action. So we've taken one of the barriers, which is working for free. And what we want to do in this part is to get you to, to really think about how some of, um, about how part of the barriers are um, about process and systems and structures um, and what we can do to change those, but also what are the cultural changes that need to happen within your organisation? You know, you can change a system or a process, but if the thinking and the ethos and the staff aren't on board with that process change, it's going to fall apart. So to, to talk through an example for you, we've chosen working for free. So thinking about process, what we want is um, the first one is being clear on timescales, what experience they'll gain and progression in that volunteer role. You know, so people, volunteers are kind of able to understand and justify and want to work for free, but also alongside being clear and, and um, about that, you really need that transparency embedded into your working processes and development opportunities um, within your organisation. So our staff and our organisations have to be really transparent about things like progression routes. Another process regarding working for free, um, support your volunteers to search and apply for jobs. Um, a cultural change within that might be 
working with your HR department to promote internal jobs to volunteers and allow flexibility for people to attend interviews. OK, so you've got a culture in your organisation where you're supportive of volunteers going on to paid work. Uh, number three, the process example is um, expenses policy. This seems like a really simple thing, but again and again, it's, it, it's problematic. Ensure your expenses policy is easy to use and pay up front for costs. Don't expect volunteers to have that cash in their bank account. Not everybody has cash rolling around or reimburse as quickly as possible. You know, best practice is to pay up front. Um, but, for, you know, we're like, oh, well, our finance processes don't make it work. How can you make that work? And cultural. Train the finance team and staff to know why we need to pay up front or why we need to reimburse quickly. If you have never, if you don't have to think about how much money is in your account or what, how you're going to pay for the bus next time, you know, you're not going to realise how important it is to have expenses um, paid promptly. Last one, uh, before I hand over to you, of course, um, ensure your programme is flexible um, for people to prioritise paid work. So that's a process. You know, you're not um, force, you're not saying these are the only time slots and you must do it during Monday to Friday, nine to five. That might be when people need to prioritise paid work, for example. So that's a process that you can instill. But what's the cultural change behind that? It's um, challenging assumptions that that you know within your organization that volunteering is the only responsibility that th that volunteers have or the, or the priority in their lives it's not likely to be the priority getting paid work is probably the priority caring responsibilities might be the priority etc cetera, etc cetera. um and you know to to support that you can um deliver um or commission staff training OK, so we need our we need our staff, we need the people in our organisations to really be aware and knowledgeable about the processes and systems that we want to change and understand the reasons behind it. So hopefully um, that will help you as an example. Now, if we go on to the next slide, what we're going to do is we've helpfully kept our list of barriers there on the side for you. When you go into your next breakout rooms, you pick one barrier decide it quickly because we don't have much time today and there's so much to talk about just pick one of the barriers and we want you to break it down and think about some of the processes and structures that um that are connected to that barrier and how they might need to change and secondary to that think about the culture and organizational change that um may need to be addressed to make sure that you know that systems change actually is effective I hope you um, feel quite happy and confident. So do um, put stuff in the chat. And remember, as you're um, talking, to pop things on the Menti so that we can record this and we can capture everything and share it afterwards so you can, you can take these conversations with you, okay? So discuss in your groups, but also record on the Menti. Um, I believe we're going to go into breakout rooms for about 15 minutes. Um, and then come back and have, um, again, a bit of a discussion afterwards um, on this. Ready to go? Okay, welcome back to the room. Thank you so much, um, everyone. If you, uh, Just use this last minute to, to add any final words to, to, to the Mentimeter. Um, we had um, lots coming in, which is great. I wonder, um, Fran, if, I don't know whether we can scroll to the top as people are writing or, because um, I just want to pull out some examples. Um, that would be fab. So we've only got about five minutes left, um, but I hope that, you know, this is the beginning of just thinking and discussing about how you can, how you can apply um, some of these ideas to remove barriers. So um, picking out some, some things here as we go down, um, showcasing and celebrating working class heritage. I feel like that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's like a base one, isn't it? It's, it's what have you got in your collections and your programming that actually is relevant to the audience that, that you're trying to target to volunteer? 
um, that should be there, right? You should you should be telling those stories already, and that's only going to help you. Um, what else? I something um, else that I saw that was interesting was around, you know, having open conversations um, and being uh, being flexible to to you know what people what volunteers other responsibilities are for example and that's really key and I think what's even a step further is to you know be have be open to conversations but get in there first and um let people know that that you're flexible for for responsibilities and you're aware that they're going to have other things going on and you know other priorities um give them a list of all of the ways that you can be flexible so they're not having to ask you okay that that's a difficult thing often um is to be put in a position where you have to ask for something um because it's not being provided already so get in there first with those open conversations and what you've got to offer um thank you so much um Another thing, um, more somebody was uh, one of the groups was talking about making more of a person specification than a job description. And I thought that was really useful because they said this group said, you know, the museum skills are what you you learn in the in the role, um, but actually, you know, the the so it doesn't need to be the job description as your your volunteer call out necessarily for what skills they need. Um, but of course, you should describe the job without any jargon um, in easy terms so that, um, you know, we all know what it is to be a, a volunteer archive assistant or, whatever, you know, <laughs> whichever role it is. Um, Fran, were there any that you wanted to pull out? Um, I'm just reading. I, I'm slow at reading, so. Okay. No problem. Um so as we go down, let's see, work with working with other organizations that emphasize language and cultural aspects and so multilingual speakers can receive support. Fantastic. Yeah. So if you don't have the skill set to fully support people within your organization, who are those partner organizations? Um, true cost reimbursement, travel, lunch and childcare. Yes. Um, you know. It's it's that wrap around, isn't it? Wrap around financial support. So the time that they're there, but also getting there and what other things they might be sacrificing to be there. Brilliant. Um, yeah, home volunteering expenses, utilities. What a great idea. Absolutely. Understanding from your local communities, what their needs and wants are and how they'd like to engage with our organizations if they could. Yeah. Absolutely, because we're, we're, we're often just going out there with, oh, we've created this opportunity in this role, would you like to do it? And we need to maybe come from, you know, be more community centric than museum centric, right? Definitely. Yeah, two way process, absolutely. Be open to changing your approach from feedback from prospective volunteers. Absolutely. We don't know everything. We may feel like we know, you know, our museums or our heritage settings um, better than, you know, prospective volunteers. Be open, be open to, kind of, to feedback. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, I mean, there's fantastic examples on here. And what we're going to do is after this session, you'll receive a copy of these slides. So you'll be able to, to return to this and continue your thinking. Um, so thank you so much. There's, the, there's so much there to, to draw on. Um, I think we've just got one last slide before we finish. Perfect. So in our last minute, we're going to um, tell you to get in touch. So you may be a working class person working in heritage. So join Museum as Muck. We don't ask, there's no membership fees. Join us, get in touch, head to our website. That's the first um, address there, museumasmuck.co.uk. 
Um, but you might also be an organisation that wants to talk to us more about how we can look at addressing barriers in the heritage sector for volunteers or staff or any other thing to do with class and museums and heritage. So follow us on Twitter to keep up with what we're doing. If you are a mucker, which is what we affectionately refer to our working class museum and heritage workers, join our Facebook group. That's a private forum where we can discuss and share our hopes and dreams and fears. <laughs> um, but last on there is our Gmail where you can just get in touch with anything, say hello, ask a question. Um, so thank you very much for everyone who contributed today and you've, um, you know, already brilliant thinking in, in, in this group. So thank you so much and we hope to um, speak to you soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fran and Michelle, a lot to reflect on. And then my challenge to us all is taking that back into our workplace. The number of times I sit on a course and we all have these brilliant ideas and then we get consumed when we go back. So if you could just think about one thing that you might change, that's one thing closer to being more inclusive of, of working class volunteers. So thank you so much. I now have got the great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Robert Henderson. Robert Henderson is the Engagement Manager at Volunteer Matters and works on Action Earth. And it's a small grant scheme that's run across Scotland that's funded by Nature Scott. Um, and Robert has worked on this campaign for 12 years and um, is going to be talking about a particular piece of work around grassroots volunteering. Um, so over to you. Robert. No, I've, I've got my, sh my slide show up. I'm just checking that that's seen, seen by everyone there. I can absolutely that's, see this. And also just to let everybody know that when um, Robert's finished, there's five minutes for questions. So please do, if you want to ask a question of Robert, put Robert first and then say the question and we'll be closing, closing up the session with Q&A with Robert. So over to you. That's brilliant. Um, right, I'm just going to run through. It'll be a brief. I have to apologise for my voice. I've got a very bad throat. Um, but uh, it's a very visual project, um, and I think the pictures will sell. You know, the people who are involved, the areas that they're working on, and the sort of activities that they're doing um, much better than I could. But basically, um, everything that we're going to bring up, these are, every year we get amazing photos from our projects, and it just shows the diversity of things that are going on uh, across the whole of Scotland. And all the photos that are from last year, every year we get an amazing selection. We never have to uh, use library photos or anything. They're all um, from our projects. So what is Action Earth? Well, it's easy to access environmental grants. And we're basically trying to get people to look at a local level at what they can do to help with the, the two main things that are the problem at the moment for us in terms of environment, the climate emergency and the nature crisis. We're losing huge amount of species in Scotland. Um, you know, so we need to encourage people to act locally. And um, we've been supported in doing this uh, by Nature Scott. So, um, you know, it's, it's very much a partnership. Um, the uh, parameters of the campaign are mutually agreed generally as well. Um, and every year we've got about £45,000 worth of grants to give out. So it's a small grants campaign, but it does have um, quite amazing results for the amount of money that we're giving these groups. So groups are available to, if they've got 15 volunteers or more, they're able to apply to us for £250. Um, up until recently, we also had £500 grants as well, but um, just because of cutbacks and things, we're, we're back to £250 again this year. Um, and the sort of activities, it's it's very wide ranging. Um, you know, we're, we're open to all new ideas, but you know, it's um, there's a lot of work being done in urban areas, um, around sort of community gardens and green spaced shared areas. Um, more rural areas will do things like meadows, woodlands, ponds, shared green spaces. Um, and last year, uh, we had 150 projects were awarded money um, right across Scotland. There's no local authority where we aren't actually operating on. 
Um, and you can see it's everything from sort of like you know, small scale events, you know, where children are being encouraged to take a space in an allotment and plant it up for biodiversity to more specialized things where ponds are skimmed for invasive species. Um, and, uh, you know, there's other projects where we're involving people who might have um, health issues, disabilities, uh, life limiting conditions and stuff. So. These are the, the basic things that, that tell you what Action Earth is about. I'm not going to read through all of them, but one of the key things that we, we try and do is to make sure that the funding is going where it's going to have the biggest impact and where it's most needed. And we do have the lowest 20% of SIMD areas. We have um, generally about 40 to 45% of our projects take place in those areas. But sort of going back to what Debbie had said earlier about, you know, sort of like how keen people in those areas are to be involved, there's actually about 50% of our volunteer numbers come from those areas. So although it's only 45% in terms of the number of projects, it's accounting for 50% of the volunteers. So there's obviously a greater number of volunteers in each of those areas. Um, and you can see there the list, all the benefits that, uh, you know, the project brings. So uh, last year we had 4,406 volunteers, which is great because of those 2,273 were new to environmental volunteering. So we're bringing people new all the time, you know, we're, we're hitting, hitting targets of not just sort of supporting existing projects and people, but actually encouraging new people all the time. And also um, younger people, we've got very high stats for that as well, 1,584 out of those 4,406. And again, you can see uh, the photos sort of demonstrate how much fun, enjoyability people have in getting involved. Um, here's the stat that I mentioned earlier on. As I say, you know, it's it's we're, we do a lot of targeting towards areas where there is the multiple deprivation stats, you know, and we, we do very well on that. Um, we, we're open to applications from anyone, but we do target once, um, you know, once campaign's going, we're targeting, we know groups, we've been around for 15 years, so we know where the groups are, what they're doing, and uh, we'll follow them up. And as I say, 50% of the volunteers are from those areas. Um, another thing that we are very keen to support is um, disability, health conditions, social isolation because of health conditions. And we've got the breakdown there. There's 1,317 volunteers last year had those defined health issues, which are all listed there. Um, and these are only um, numbers where people have told us. So the numbers can actually be higher. These are just where people have been happy to let us know in their feedback, um, you know, sort of where people were in those categories if they had volunteers. And just an idea of the range of, of things that we cover. Um, these are just some of the groups from last year. So, you know, people from Scotland will probably recognise, if not the location, certainly some of the groups there. Um, and it just shows, you know, what a great range of people that we're getting across the board. In terms of the areas that we cover, last year, because of the COP being held in Glasgow, 46% um, of our projects, 46 uh, projects, which is about a third of what we had, came from Glasgow. But generally, we're split across the local authorities. And I'll have another graph later, which shows you where the uh, lower SIMD local authorities actually are. Um, we do use the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. Um, and we always say that this map, we recommend it to all projects that we support to have a look, because it's very handy for them when they're putting in um, funding bids for bigger pots of money. And it's amazing how few people actually go on and use this. Um, we always say to people, even have a look at where you stay yourself and your family, um, because it's a very engaging tool. It's very easy to use and uh, you know very, very helpful for groups when they're making funding applications, because you can almost see that sometimes the line between uh, the red, which is the bottom 20%, uh, and blue, the dark blue, which is the top 20%, there can sometimes be a line even just across a road. And if people are creating funding bids, they'd be able to know, um, you know which area to focus on in terms of volunteers and activities. Um, the SIMD, thing, as was previously mentioned, it's across seven different categories. And that's one of the interesting things about using the map 
people can work out why, you know, where the ratings are for things. Um, there are generally about 750 to 800 people in each of the, the data zones, but there's 6,976 of these zones. So, um, you know, it's, it's all useful information, I think, for people to know. And graphs like this, which are also on that site, will give you a break. This is all 32 local authorities in Scotland. So you can see at the top there, um, you know, those are the ones where we would do most of our follow-up focusing on and trying to encourage more applications from. But it doesn't mean that areas at the bottom don't have issues as well. And we always say to people, don't use SIMD as a sole guide in what you're you're looking for. Um, and this, just as a point of interest, these are the, the 10 most deprived areas. Um, in Scotland as well. All this information is there and it can sometimes be very useful when you're dealing with um, some of the projects we know that are in Fergusley and Paisley, um, that they know that you know they can put that information in as part of funding bids to other uh, groups as well. Um, so how do we tackle um, getting the information down beyond that as well? Well, one obvious way is going through volunteer centres and umbrella organisations. Um, there's about 60 volunteer centres, third sector interfaces across Scotland, um, and we use previous graphs to, to help us decide which ones are you know, definitely worth following up. And in terms of umbrella organisations, you've got people like Trellis, um, who uh, you know, are a therapeutic horticulture umbrella group, lots of information there. All those other groups there, Scottish Association for Mental Health, um, Sembo Scotland is all about getting ethnic minorities, volunteering uh, in, enhanced and increased. And um, you've also got people like Social Farms and Gardens as well. Um, we, we've also built up 15 years worth of, of mailing lists. So we've got people that we can send that information out to. And um, Nature Scott has been very good as well. But one of the things that we send out to all our projects is a draft press release and a set of every uh, press contact for Scotland in a table so that they can do their own follow-up because they have local papers, they've got local contacts, they've got local organisations that they can send information out to. And if the projects sell us as a campaign as much as they sell themselves locally. And because they're all doing brilliant photos like these, um, you know, we encourage everyone to have some sort of social media presence that we can jump on to, you know, we retweet, we follow them, and we can then see who they're following as well, and we can chase people up through routes like that. Um, another example of how the photos can sell the story, people want to see people who look like them doing activities that they can do in areas that look like the areas that they work in. And when you get things like this, this is from Germiston Allotment, and it's the four stage progress of a project. And although they had 250 pounds from us, like most of the projects we know, they're able to source sort of free seeds, free materials, um, you know, and enhance what they're doing as projects. And this is another project to Ridge and Dunbar. And again, you know, great at showing the before and after pictures of what they're doing. The environmental impact can't be underestimated as well. So, you know, uh, for a small campaign, we do have brilliant outcomes and, uh, you know, that's, that's always worth celebrating as well. Um, we get very good feedback from the organisations. We try and be as supportive as we can. Um, and uh, we like the one from Bridgend Farmhouse. We love Action Earth. And, uh, you know, we, we would use that to help promote ourselves in their local area as well. And so just as a, a, a final thing, um, we'd be grateful for anyone that can help promote Action Earth. We're almost finished our grants, um, but uh, we'll bound to have a few cancellations and we'd be very happy to see some more. Um, we've got a great Facebook page, uh, which we're updating all the time. It's not a static page. Um, 150 projects all report within a two month period. So this is the period that's happening. So there's lots going on just now um, and we'd encourage you to have a look. And finally, just uh, thank you. There's a photo there of me with my volunteer, Joe, who I hadn't seen for two and a half years because of COVID. But uh, Joe is a great example of somebody who has uh, been with me for 12 years um, and uh, has given sort of an immense service to the project. He's, he's a co-worker um, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, so that is my presentation. I hope I've managed to cover that in the time that I've been allowed.
Absolutely, Robert. Supreme. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> so we are going to, we've got about two or three minutes for questions. Um, has, if anyone's got a question, start thinking about it. Either put it in the chat function or you can use the reaction list. I'm going to demonstrate here. There's something, if you go at the bottom of your toolbar for reactions, it says raise hand. So, and this is what happens. This enables me to know who wants to ask a question. But while you're all thinking of your questions, Robert, I've got a question for you. It's a real practical question. So imagine I'm a volunteer manager in a museum in Scotland. So I'm a museum-y person. Obviously, we have assets um, for our, our collections are assets, but we also might have assets in terms of space um, and grounds. Um, is there any way we could work with the, the smaller projects to, 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 to uh, provide them, I suppose, with access to that space and grounds so they can do their thing with, with money from you, but they can do it on, on our space? Uh, absolutely. We've, we've got lots of heritage based uh, projects that, that come forward every year. We've got projects that, you know, that in well, museums, libraries, we have projects in hospital grounds, um, you know, so we'd, we'd be delighted. Um, and we have got a few historic sites as well, um, you know, where they've maybe got a bit of community space that they want to turn into a, sort of like a, you know, a wildflower meadow or a wildflower area. It's all going to obviously enhance, you know, historic Historic Environment Scotland sites and stuff. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're very happy. And, and you might want to invite local groups to come in and work with the existing volunteers as well, rather yeah. than just have the volunteers there. So we're, we're open to, you know, any idea, anything that involves cooperation. And, you know, if a site wants to get in touch with us, we can maybe even tell them about previous projects we've had in the local area that might be interested in coming along and helping out. Fantastic. Brilliant, Robert. Um, Joanne uh, has got her hand up. Over to you, Joanna. And this might be our last question because uh, we're going to move on to something else in a moment. So over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Robert. That was really fascinating. And it was interesting. Um, you, you told us a lot about how you really try to spread the word out to, through so many different networks and, and make people aware that they can come to you for these, these grants, which is fantastic. I was wondering, do you also kind of look at where there might be gaps, where you're not finding that people are um, uh, kind of applying to, to you to, for grants and, and, and what do you do uh, about that, whether that be uh, geographic areas or different demographics of um, groups and individuals? Yes, well, normally about halfway through the campaign, we do look geographically to see, you know, how the spread is going and we will target places and, you know, the volunteer centres, I have to say, are, are brilliant, you know, they're really, really good, um, you know, uh, but we, some of the, you know, we've, we've done a lot of work at uh, targeting of, you know, refugee and asylum seeker groups, um, and it, it's never really resulted in a, a big response. You know, so there's issues like that. LGBT as well. We've done quite a lot of targeting of LGBT groups, but a lot of them doing outdoor environmental work doesn't really fit in with, you know, what they're planning to do. So we're, we're open to anyone coming to us and, you know, sort of saying, I don't think your campaign's covering this, um, you know, and, and can we help you? You know, we'd, we'd absolutely love any input and help at all. But we're always reviewing and, you know, every year with Nature Scott, we look at what their priorities as well. And we've always been very good at being able to adapt it, um, you know, and sort of like the, the health thing we covered for about three years with enhanced health grants and stuff, you know, and that was great. And that definitely boosted um, numbers of people who had disabilities and defined health issues. Wonderful. Thank you, Robert, for answering that question. Um, as you can gather, Robert is up for any conversation, anything to move this forward. So if you do have a question or you've got an idea that's percolating, contact uh, Robert at Action Earth, uh, Volunteers Matter, and uh, move that, that conversation forward. Thank you so much, Robert, for Thanks participating so today. Um, I am uh, excited to be able to introduce our next speaker. And our next speaker, Lauren Arthur, is the Engagement Investment Manager at National Lottery, Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, I love this bio. So Lauren is the loudest introvert in the room, a lover of music, boxing and football, a big advocate for capacity building and empowering communities. Creative, positive and always up for a coffee, a blether and a biscuit. 
So Lauren's on a pre-record. So we are going to show her film now. And then once we've watched her film, we'll very move swiftly into our panel Q&A, which is the last part of today's session. So think on around any questions you would like to ask. Debbie, who we saw right at the beginning of the day. Michelle, Fran, Lauren, and also we've got a new speaker coming to the panel, Phoenix. I'll introduce her in more detail at that point. But other than that, um, Rosie B, you can play the film. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lauren Arthur. I'm currently one of the engagement managers at the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Huge thank you for coming along to the event today. And a huge thank you to the Make Your Mark team for inviting me along to be a speaker. I'm going to be chatting about my lived experience as a working class individual in the heritage sector. First of all, of course, if you may or may not know what is lived experience. And I mean, I guess for me, lived experience is a representation or having a representation of the experiences and choices of an individual and the knowledge that they've learned from that. So for me, I grew up, I was born and raised in a small little place called Tullabuddy in Clipman and Shire. Uh, single parent household, so oldest of three as well. So I sort of took up that second parent role, um, which came with a lot of experience. Um, however, I went to school, everything was fine. Now, Tullabuddy is quite a deprived area. Uh, so I attended Lawrence Hill Academy, was pretty much average going through school, um, towards fifth and sixth year, the pressures put on about going to university and, you know, if you don't go to university and get a degree, you won't have a good job, you know, and that cycle of poverty continues. So there was a lot of pressure on me, especially being the eldest in the family. Um, so in fifth year, I did four hires really struggled with it. I'm not academic at all. I'm more creative and um, more practical learner, visual learner, everything. I'm just not academic. Um, so I really struggled in fifth year. Um, but I got some grades. And when it comes to sixth year, I was encouraged to do four more hires, um, which I didn't want to do. I knew I didn't have the capacity in me to do it. It took a huge strain on my mental and physical health. Um, so the school's response was, okay, if you don't want to do four hires again, there's no point in you being at school. Why don't you go off? Apologies if you can hear that in the background. There's some gardening works going out, going on outside. Um, yeah, so the school's, the school's point of view was, okay, if you don't want to go off and do four more hires, why don't you go off and be a hairdresser? Um, now, I have nothing against hairdressers, you know, every job is a valuable one. Um, but I knew that's not what I wanted to do. So we then sort of come to an agreement that if I volunteered one day a week, I could stay at school and do less hires. So that's what I did. And I started volunteering one day a week on a Wednesday with the Coalfields Regeneration Trust. First of all, it was started off as an admin role. Um, as they had a grant program, so I did a lot of the admin around that. And then I sort of moved into the community action side of things, um, where I was going out, doing events, engaging with communities. From that, results day came for six years. I had applied to go to university to study psychology. Uh, I wasn't, like I said, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I didn't want to be a hairdresser. That wasn't, that wasn't my kind of interest and passion. But I knew I wanted to work with people and I wanted to make a difference in people's lives. So I chose to go down the psychology route. Because I was from Tullabuddy and attended Launch Hill Academy, they were known as a LEAP school. So that was areas of deprivation. So schools in areas of high deprivation have, I don't know how to put it actually, have, um, lower the expectations to get into university let's say so it's it's supposed to be a fairer process so i did get into university um but again really struggled with the academic side of things um really took its toll and there was not much adaptability there you know it was coursework essays 
everything that I was just really, really struggled with. So I ended up, I left, I'd done my year um, and I left with a HNC and Paul Fields had said, why don't you come back and work with us for the summer? So I did and I absolutely loved, you know, building that capacity in communities, encouraging empowerment with communities, hearing their voices and it was that light bulb moment of this is what I wanted to do. So they then offered me an apprenticeship that they, it was a bespoke apprenticeship to suit my needs. So I did a personal development award in community involvement, which was very practical. And I ended up securing employment as a community coordinator. Um, so my role was all about engaging with communities and helping them create five year action plans, which would then be used to lobby for funding and improvements to their areas. Now, a lot of the areas that I worked with was, you know, high areas of deprivation, a lot of vulnerable groups. So I could use my own experience to work with them. How I got into the heritage sector was I come across a programme called 2027, which is a personal development programme that is all about getting people who identify as working class into the funding sector. Um, so, of course, I identify as working class. I loved the idea of diversifying the funding sector and getting different approaches and perspectives. So I applied and I was successful. So I was a member of the first cohort in Scotland. And the way that the programme works is your profile, if you're successful, gets matched to your host organisation. So I was matched with two. I was matched with the Community Fund, National Lottery Community Fund and the National Lottery Heritage Fund. And straight away, I was drawn to the Community Fund because of my background and my previous experiences. And I, I, tell you, I did, I, struck, I was too shy to go towards the Heritage Fund. I was, I was really apprehensive about going there. Um, and I think that comes down to that term heritage, um, which since I've been at the Fund, which is just over a, over a year now, I've seen it as quite a big barrier, actually, um, when it comes to engaging with different groups and different people. Yeah, so for me, that word heritage, I was really, really scared of it. You know, my my perspective of heritage, along with many others, you know, is it's predominantly older, white, middle class, upper class term. Uh, so I didn't see myself fitting into that and being able to work with that. I, I didn't have a heritage background. You know, if someone asked me then, what is heritage? I wouldn't have had an answer, really. I would have really struggled to come up with an answer and I still do. You know, I love posing that question to groups because I love the diverse range of answers. And it's also, it's building up my own knowledge as well um, because we've all got different opinions. So because I was so, intimidated by that word heritage let's say i was more drawn to the community fund um but after some talks with the coach on the 2027 program they sort of guided me towards you know get out your comfort zone take a leap of faith you've got the right skills the right knowledge you know as a working class person with your lived experience you can make a difference here so i joined the fund and the first few months, imposter syndrome, and I still get it to this day every so often, that bit of imposter syndrome just eats away at me because I felt like I didn't belong. Um, you know, I don't have a degree, certainly don't have a heritage background. Um, but this, I mean, the staff were lovely, made me feel really, really comfortable and were really interested in what I had to say and what my perspectives were, um, which really helped. So I think for the fund as well, the benefit, of me was I was able to bring in different perspectives, different approaches, and I started to believe in myself once I started doing the work. And it was that light bulb moment of, hold on, if I was scared of the word heritage and intimidated by it and all these other things, of course, other people are going to feel like that. So I used that in my lived experience and knowledge to adapt how I worked with groups and how we became more approachable as a funder um, because we do, we have identified groups of people that we've identified don't engage with us. And I could start to understand and see why. Um, so that's my role. My role was to engage with new stakeholders, new groups, 
provide pre-application support. Um, and I've loved every minute of it. But I think in terms of volunteering, my career started off as volunteering. You know, I, like I said, don't have a degree. It purely comes down to my own experiences in life and my volunteer experience. So I think when it comes to diversifying volunteers with projects, I think the main thing is, and I think funders need to do this better as well, is practice what you preach. You know, it's, it's a different world out there. EDI is so important. You know, your equality, diversity and inclusion is, it's huge. It's a huge area that I think needs to be improved more. People need to do more in that area. So I think it's a bit about practicing what you preach, especially at the top level. You know, if we have, if as a funder, if we're working projects and volunteers to be more diverse and inclusive, we need to be seen as being more diverse and inclusive. Um, I think working class isn't a protected character, characteristic, so it is often forgotten about. Um, so I think, yeah, we need to have that model of practice what you preach and ensure that the board, trustees, the decision makers, the people on the ground, we're, we're diverse and we're inclusive. Um, and hopefully that should filter down to the projects as well. It would also help people want to volunteer as well if they can see that it's been diverse and inclusive. It, they can then, it makes it more relatable, I would say. Definitely, if if you, if a person can feel identified and relatable to something, they will be more likely to approach it and want to be part of it. Uh, I think as well, it comes down to a lot of people have it, build it and they will come. It, it does work sometimes. Um, I'm a big believer in build it with them instead of build it and they will come. And I guess that comes down to my experience working with communities for over six years. You don't just want to parachute in and it's the exact same with projects. You know, who is your audience? Who are you looking for to be involved in volunteering? Being mindful of that word heritage. What, how, do, how do your volunteers or potential target groups, how do they feel about heritage? How do they feel about volunteering? How can you make it a more enjoyable experience for them? Is the activities ad adaptable and accessible? You know, heritage is defined by us at the fund as something that you want to preserve for future generations. It's important, of course it is, to preserve it now for future generations, but you don't know who those generations are going to be. So it really is important to be as accessible and adaptable as possible to ensure that heritage is preserved. So, yeah, I think it's really important to understand the needs of volunteers. What does volunteering mean to them? What are they looking to get out of it? Is it beneficial and substantial to them? Things like paid internships and volunteer expenses is another big thing for volunteers. You know, we have just been battered the last few years between COVID, the cost of living crisis, and it's people who identify as working class that are, you know, they're, they're missing that support and they've got big challenges. So it's about how can you make your project accessible to them and meet their needs. And volunteer expenses is something that is really, really important. You know, working class, low incomes, single parent families, it's really broad. So it's thinking about their needs. And this is where co-designing and having their input from the start and building it with them is really important because you can understand their needs. You know, you've got travel expenses, childcare, there may be language barriers or disabilities there as well. So it's incorporating a package, a bespoke package that's accessible to people. The paid internships as well. You know, if you want to build skills and capacity, it would be good to be able to offer paid internships and build that capacity and those skills and that confidence. Some people may just want to come to get out of the house, mental health and well-being, to have a break, and that's absolutely fine. But it's making sure that your project is being considerate of who they're working with and what their needs are in order for them to engage and be part of it. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think it's got to be a two-way partnership between the project and the volunteers. Uh, training as well. I think if you're offering training, it's great, but be mindful that not everyone's academic. 
Um, so making sure again that that's adaptable and accessible. Um, and I think I've been, I feel like I've been waffling on for ages now, and I hope that that's, it's been quite valuable and interesting. But yeah, I think I've absolutely loved the journey that I've been on. And like I said, still imposter syndrome creeps up every now and then. Um, but I've got amazing staff that work alongside me. One of the things that I will say is lived experience has been talked about more. And the fund committed to 2027 is fantastic because they're looking at diversifying their workforce. Um, but what I will say is it is important to have the degrees and the skill sets and things as well. You know, it has to be a balance. Um, because there is some technical things, especially in heritage, that I don't understand and I have to go away and ask. But I think we need to get better at asking as well. You know, putting your hand up and saying, I don't really know what I'm doing, can you help? Um, we need to get better at that as well. And that is for volunteers as well and projects. And about connecting up, speaking to each other. You know, the people that you're looking to work with are the ones with the experience and the knowledge on the ground. They know who to talk to, they know the needs of the communities, they, it's it's the sense of place is what it comes down to and they'll have that sense of place and that knowledge and expertise. Um, I think the, the biggest, the, I mean the way that I can just sum it up is the biggest compliment I've had in my job role as it stands is going out and speaking to community groups and being told you're not the traditional funding officer and to me that I know I knew I was doing my job right. I want to be approachable. Funders, heritage, all those terms, the language, it's not as scary as it seems. We do want to support people. We do want to work with people. And it's just about being approachable and for people being able to identify themselves with you and be relatable. They feel comfortable. You're building that trust in those relationships because without people, projects just wouldn't exist. And it's the same with you know people in all aspects people on the ground the volunteers especially the volunteers they're you know they help make the magic happen they help make the work happen without them it just wouldn't happen um and of course going back to everything that we're going through you know covid cost of living it's being mindful that volunteers are exhausted so how can we help and support them, especially with heritage projects, to make them feel more connected, more supported, and to be part of something that they really enjoy and are interested in, which comes back to the model of building it with them. What heritage is it that they're interested in? What skills, what experience is needed? Yeah, so that I feel like it's a lot that I've spoke to you about. <laughs> Um, I'm always up for a cuppa and a blather, as you can probably tell. Um, so hopefully, make your mark. I'll be sharing our details afterwards. More than happy to, you know, have some conversations afterwards, reflections, questions. Would also be really interested to know how you feel about heritage and what heritage means to you. So maybe that's something that you can pop in the chat box now. Um, I would love to to go through that. Um, and yeah, hope to chat soon. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Always lovely uh, to, to listen to your reflections, Lauren. So we're now at the final stage of today's programme and it's a panel. So we're going to invite back, I'd like to welcome back onto the space, the pinned space. Um, Debbie, uh, Fran, Lauren, and also to welcome Phoenix. So let me give you a little bit of a blurb and again, another great bio. So Phoenix, is a multidisciplinary artist and heritage community engagement supporter. They love finding creative and sustainable ways to preserve heritage. At a young age, they saw a need to record and research their own diverse heritage, Black, African, Caribbean, Pagan, queer, and a working class lass from Yorkshire. They are proud and comfortable of all that makes them well, and their foremothers and fathers have had to deal with the patriarchy, colonists, classicists, and classic barriers to customs, traditions that um, uh, have had a, a significant impact over time. For the heritage sector, Phoenix started to see the true value of lived experience 
Many communities who identified as working class had to face others manipulating narratives, profiteering from bias, histories, and moving the goalposts. I'm sure a number of those things resonate with people in this space of cultural legacy. Phoenix has years of experience working with grassroots communities and organizations to try and dismantle this. Welcome, Phoenix. So, what an amazing group of people. So we've got three questions already. And so I'm gonna ask the first question and this, uh, anyone can, can respond. So this isn't a targeted question. So this is a question from, from Ruth Oliver. And her question is, and it's a very broad question, she says so herself. In principle, do we want people to volunteer because it's free labor or is the ultimate aim engagement? Now, Ruth has got an opinion, but before I share her opinion, or you might want to share it yourself, Ruth, um, what do people think? So let me repeat that question. Do we want people to volunteer because it's free labor or is the ultimate aim engagement? Does anyone have a particular view on, on that? Yeah, I, I, it should never be about free labor. It should always be about engagement. It should be about benefits to the organization and to the individual volunteer, but it, it shouldn't be um, about free labor. Yeah, I'd Very agree. Good. Sorry, I just, <laughs> just jump on, on. <laughs> I'd agree, but also I would say that that's something that organizations need to really think about because that isn't always the case. Sometimes it is about free labor or those lines can be blurred. So I think it's when we were thinking about like cultural things, that's something really you need to consider in your organization and how that kind of comes across and how that permeates what volunteers do in your organization. Yeah, so being able to challenge that notion. Lauren, Phoenix, any other reflections? You don't have to, but is there anything else you'd like to add about that question about the ultimate aim? Is it free labor or is our ultimate aim engagement? When I first heard that, I thought that is a case of uh, percentages. That's just my brain just thought of it. I think it's 90% community engagement and 10% labor, not free labor. Labor in the sense of trading skills and techniques and ideas because we assume that people that want to get involved in the heritage sector, they know they want to get into it. It's fantastic. It's great. But someone that's just left school, someone that's just come back from their caring responsibilities, they may want to learn some new skills and they have no idea. So that kind of labor in terms of sharing skills, exchanging ideas, yes, not free labor in that sense. And 90% community engagement, you are or you will feel comfortable where you see people that look like you, that sound like you. That's as simple as that. It's great to have volunteers that look like you, sound like you. And if you can see them more often on, on different levels, working with different people, I'm all for it. And I think that should be supported. Thank you, Phoenix. Lauren, any additional reflections to add to the richness? I totally agree with um, what the panellists said. Um, I think it's got to be a two-way partnership. As I said previously, it has to be substantial and beneficial. Um, I think a lot of the time it comes down to language as well and terminology used. A lot of people, you know, what does volunteering mean? We'll say, oh, it's giving up free time to help and things like that. Um, and as Phoenix says, it's more about sharing skills, knowledge, experience, building connections. There's so much more to it. So I think organisations need to explore that more. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for me, I think it's got to be about engagement and getting people involved. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I always use the term healthy volunteering that's non-exploitative. As soon as it gets to that point where you feel you're being exploited, it's a time to find a new organisation or a new role because it should absolutely be that partnership, that collaboration all the way through. Thank you so much. We've got another question. And this question is from Chloe Ward. So Chloe's question again, and it's a question for anybody uh, in the panel, but also if you're in the room and you've got experience in this, um, then please uh, please also put your, your experiences in the chat function. So Chloe's question is, does anyone on the panel have any experience of working with tempo in brackets, time credits? Um, they've been brought to uh, Chloe's attention as a potential way of raising awareness of volunteering amongst different groups of people who might be drawn to the rewards that they get with time credits. I suppose it's like sort of gamification, trying to make it more like a, a hunt or something that you'll get a, a ridiculous return on investment. So um, 
Chloe's just trying to gather information. So either the panel or also, I think the, the 80 odd people that are also in the, the room, has anyone come across Tempo or heard tell of it? I'm seeing a shaking head from Debbie. Anyone else on the panel? Joanna Todd from HES has put something in. It's not in Scotland yet, but else, elsewhere. Thank you for that intel. There's um, a lot in London um, from what I've gathered from my friends down in London. There's sector is quite big down there, um, yeah. but it's not spread far and wide yet. But worth the conversation, investigate a bit more. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've got a question. Uh, next one. So bear, just bear with me. I'm just going to get back into my chat function for whatever reason. Bear with. So this is a question for Lauren. So I'm giving you lots of time because what I'm now going to try and do is actually find this question on my screen. <laughs> Apologies. So Lauren, question for you is what would you tell yourself then now you are where you are now if that makes any sense so to summarize again if now what would you tell yourself then when you're starting your journey um in the the heritage sector what would be that one thing you would tell yourself oh that is a really tricky question um thanks <laughs> for whoever asked that one um rosie from hes apologies <laughs> rosie asked that question I think I would just say believe in myself you know have that confidence in myself and my own journey so far and the experiences that I've had since I was younger um, and use that mentality and those approaches to how I work um, you know as I said imposter syndrome was massive at the time and it really took a couple of months before that light bulb moment switched on that heritage isn't as scary as I thought it was um, maybe I should have done a bit more research and maybe consulted with more like-minded people like myself um, and sort of got their, their thoughts and views on it um, and maybe that would have helped give me a bit of confidence. But um, yeah, I think I've certainly learned a lot now um, and I reflect on it quite a lot and sort of use that as my, my power to keep on going. Um, and of course, there is other 2027 associates out there. There was eight of us on the programme that were all put in different funders. So it's great to have that support network as well. Um, and we often bounce questions and theories and thoughts off each other and sort of build that support network as well. Great, right, thank you. Um, and that's what I love about today is that we're all ring fencing time to think about things, but we're thinking about things with others. And I think sometimes when you're a volunteer coordinator or, or whatever role you have in, in the sector more broadly, often you're a singleton role. You're the only person in the organisation. This is why these conferences are so helpful, where you can pull on all those resources and all those insights. So we've got another question. Again, this is for the panel in general. So let me just get it up. So the question is, from your experience, what are the best online resources to upskill yourself in inclusive volunteering and working with people from different backgrounds? But today our focus is on working class. So let me re rephrase that. So what are the best online resources to upskill yourself in inclusive volunteering, specifically working with people from working class backgrounds. Has anyone got any hints and tips other than obviously always going to Museum of Mark? But any other resources or insights? Has anyone come across anything else? Uh, I'll go on that. Brilliant, Phoenix. I was doing lots and lots of volunteering um, and I couldn't get any paid work. I decided to do some online courses um, on community development and that's with the a website called allison.com everybody please write it down they've got plenty of courses on there and they're always rejigging their courses that they have their, their things on languages and and community development stuff they're amazing um and also read.co.uk uh, forward slash courses just type in community development you know things like that diversity inclusivity especially now they've got even more courses on there please do them for those that are just are nervous and worried about coming out of their comfort zone, um, trying to get into the mentoring space or channeling safe space, please try those courses. Majority of them are very cheap or they're completely free. Um, 
please try and have a go and do it. And if you are currently volunteering and you want to go on those courses, if there's a, is a cost to them, please talk to your volunteer manager and they'll be able to sort that out. They'll be able to do that themselves and, and pay for it or, you know, do discounts and what have you. I know it's not always easy to kind of go to people and ask them, look, I've got, I see my blind spot, please can you help me? But there's lots of online stuff, please go out there and do it. So I've given you two there and um, there's lots of, volunteering organizations that do courses and things so yeah be brave you can do it brilliant signposting anyone else got any sort of hints and tips around courses or resources that are available to to help us upskill ourselves in this in this space of inclusive volunteering specifically working class anyone else got anything else I've, to share pop the wheel link in the chat um Thanks. we've got a learning and practice team um who help with like the volunteer friendly awards um and other things so they have a whole page of different guides for different groups um, and we are part of the inclusion and volunteering network so if anyone does have any particular issues or questions um, if you go onto that page there's an email address for our learning and practice team as well and um, I'm sure they would be able to help but there are guides for a lot on there um, just to help people kind of start thinking maybe a little bit differently about how they include different groups in their role in cheering. Brilliant. Thank you, Debbie. Anything else? Anyone else? I think one of the benefits while you're thinking, just in case, of the, the pandemic is that so many organisations shifted to online delivery, that there's a wealth of richness of online content that we would never have had access to in the past, but it still sits there. Most open source, so there isn't a paywall. So, that, you know, when people say, oh, I'm really interested in doing a course, and they come to me as a learning professional, and I'm like, okay, and all I'm doing behind the background is Googling, how do I learn how to do this? And then looking at all the future learn courses, open learn courses, read, etc. So Google is your friend my friend uh, because often that points you in those sort of areas but as well as using this network any other suggestions around upskilling ourselves in inclusive volunteering at all okay just add one more yeah. thing just, Always. Just, just, just popped into my head if you are of a particular demographic or intersectional demographic please reach out to people that are in those positions. There's a, such a thing as sexualism when it comes to people of diverse backgrounds and you will meet people who are from the Gypsy Roma Traveller communities, people from the BIPOC communities that are really ahead of the game in their field, but there's so little of us out there being represented. So please reach out to them in an email, read their books, find out what their point of view is, their trajectory, in an academic and non-academic sense and just ask them questions a lot of them are very helpful yes they may be busy because they're always being asked questions like me sometimes but they would love someone who's eager and would like to know more about how to get in a particular field so please ask you know when you, after you've gone googling please ask because you just never know they might say well things have changed since i was at uni or things, things have changed since i started in a certain specific sector or field but it, it is good for you now there's these internships these is traineeships so yeah ask you never know ask someone that looks like you if you if you're a bit worried and a bit scared i know representation matters but there are people out there that look like you that sound like you that are in these fields doing amazing work so please ask wonderful completely use that network to help you network and learn i think that was bringing us to the close of the panel interview while i'm doing the formal close of the event if there is any hints and tips that you would like to share Fran, Debbie, Lauren, Phoenix then please pop those in the chat function so there's one nugget you would like everybody apart from being more brave and courageous and um, then pop that in the chat function I'm sure people would like to hear from you so it's 12 27 I've been given strict instructions we need to finish on time always important not to steal people's time from other activities. It's been an absolute pleasure, a delight to listen to such an engaging, interesting content. The speakers, you've all been amazing. Uh, I always really love the sharing of insights, especially lived experience insights, that we're getting the truth rather than the spin. And I think that's really, really beneficial. Often we just hear case studies that are perfect and we know those don't exist. So. 
ring fence more time to think ring fence more time to think with others and that exercise around barriers you know any process or cultural change that you can implement to remove the barriers for working class people for us muckers because which i am one um you know those process changes those cultural changes then have much broader benefit so I think there's a real risk sometimes we think about things in silos. But what we have to remember is that occlusion is the, is the broadest reach, the biggest umbrella. So if we can be thinking on particular groups, what we can do to remove barriers, there will be some conveyed benefits to everybody. I think it's also hard when you're working potentially on your own and maybe up uh, a hill, maybe there's not an open door in your organization to have these conversations, is just to remember to be kind to yourself. You can't hold the whole burden for changing inclusion across the whole of the heritage sector, but you can do your bit to get us closer to it. So what does that bit look like? So work out what that one thing is going to be, work out what your goal is in the next three months, and don't beat yourself up too much about it if you're not making that progress. A reminder to let you know that this event has been filmed and will be shared in due course. And thank you for your participation. If this has worked for you, then please sign up and follow Make Your Mark Volunteering for Organisations on Twitter, Facebook, and also Heritage Volunteering Group. We are here to help you help others. So let us do our jobs. Thank you so much to everyone, including my tech people. And you're free to go and enjoy the rest of Wednesday. Thank you so much. Toodaloo.